I am excited to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Robert Brakey is a fifth generation graduate from the University of Michigan Medical School. He completed his family medicine residency at the University of Wisconsin in 1984 and has practiced lifestyle family medicine in Ann Arbor since 1985. He is chairman of the board and head of the family medicine division for IHA, a multi-specialty medical group centered in and around Ann Arbor. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Dr. Brakey. Please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Olivia. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, share with uh, Veg Michigan enthusiasts uh, from across the state. Uh, actually, when I signed up for this date, uh, I didn't realize I was, was gonna be in Florida. So uh, joining you from uh, West Palm Beach uh, and uh, we're hoping to head across to the Bahamas tonight in a, in a boat, that should be quite an adventure. Uh, but um, thank you again for having me. Uh, and uh, we got a lot to cover today on exploring health and vitality through great nutrition. So let me share my screen and uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, let's go to full screen. All right, can you see the screen okay there? All right, thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I have, um, uh, enjoy doing these kind of talks around the state, uh, both live and uh, by video, and uh, appreciate your attention. Um, and for some reason, we are getting technical difficulty with my slides not advancing. There we go. Um, I have no uh, potential conflict of interest here, nothing to sell, just love sharing uh, great health and uh, ways to help keep that way. Um, let's start out and say, what if you owned a racehorse? Um, not just any racehorse, this is Secretariat, one of the best of all time, and your goal is to win the Kentucky Derby. Um, in fact, the Triple Crown. Well, you're going to need a good trainer, a great jockey, some good breeding for your horse, great food, to keep him safe, have a good vet, good horseshoes, but without the right food, none of the rest of that's going to really matter. So your, your trainer says, we're gonna get the finest oats and hay for our thoroughbred. We're gonna feed him the best so he can run fastest and win the triple crown. And you say, no, this horse is an athlete. He needs protein to be strong muscles. He needs chicken and fish and seafood and cheese and meat and dairy and eggs. And of course, this is not horse food. So not only is your horse not soon running fast, he, he looks like this. Um, well, you see the analogy here. Suppose instead you're issued a human body, and uh, all of you were, and your goal is to grow it into a young, thriving adult and into longevity, healthy, uh, long age. And of course, it'd be nice to have good genetics, although that counts for a lot less than most people think. Uh, food, safe issues, uh, medical care, workouts, quality sleep, and managing stress are all important components. But once again, unless you fuel your body correctly with the right food, none of the rest is going to matter very much. And I like this little cartoon from the book, You Staying Young, where we all start out here with quality of life high as a youngster, um, maybe an acute illness right here or so. But then unfortunately, about middle age, most Americans start to gain weight, get some hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, and bam, dead at the age of 78. Uh, what instead, if you could follow this curve of longevity and quality of life well into your elder years, and then age 103 on the golf course, you get struck by lightning, um, newsflash, you're still going to all die. Uh, but see how much more area under the total curve here we have for extending quality life on into the elder years. To, to help uh, bring this um, to a better understanding, let me show you this short video uh, from you. every moment. Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. 
The average Canadian will spend their last 10 years in sickness. Change your future at makehealthlast.ca. So um, when I show this to my patients, everybody says, of course, I want to be the guy on the left. Uh, and I think we all do. And we all know examples of either grandparents, parents, friends, or others who've been either one side or the other. And the good news is that by taking good care of yourself, you have a much greater chance of being that guy on the left. Uh, let's look at food though, and separate foods into four categories. Uh, first, animal on the left, plant on the right, unprocessed on top and processed on the bottom. So you get the idea down here are processed animal foods. Up here, at least it looks close to the way nature brought it to us. Down here are processed uh, plant-based foods, um, not really recognizing where they came from. Uh, and up here are unprocessed plant foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, uh, and beans. Um, so if we were trying to explore where we find health here, it turns out that the healthy parts of real foods, the sweetness have been hijacked by the food industry to add fat, salt, and sugar to virtually anything and prove what they call the craveability index. And you all know what I'm talking about. If you've been here in San Francisco, the waitress brings you this uh, laden with fat, salt, and sugar. Uh, and then you look over and your neighbor got this. You said, dang, I got the wrong thing. Um, and uh, the, the reality is that these foods, people call foods, are not really foods at all. They're designed to bring us in, to hijack our dopamine receptors that are, are telling us that we want uh, foods with calorie density and sugars in them, because natural foods of those types are good for us uh, back in the day. Um, and uh, they, they bring us ill health in so many ways. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this bottom processed food part, because I think this audience is pretty savvy about that. Let's instead focus on this top part and say, so unprocessed foods are clearly superior for nutritional value, but are we natural omnivores? Should we be eating a balance of animal and plant foods or should we be focusing one towards one side or the other? In order to help see this, let's back up a step and say, well, what is food? In its broadest sense, anything organic is food. Uh, this rotting tree stump is food for these ants and, and maggots. Uh, this grass is food for this horse. This chicken is food for this fox. And this milk is food for this baby cow, right? But none of these are human food if we're going to define it as that which and brings us towards vitality, which helps improve our chances of longevity and decrease our chances of chronic disease along the way. People think that just because it's sold in a grocery store, that it's human food. Um, and again, it's there because people want to buy it. It may taste good, but not necessarily nourishing. In fact, tens of thousands of studies now document that the right food can improve performance, heal injuries, increase health, vitality, well-being, and longevity. Uh, but let's talk about then what makes a food health supporting. How do we define right foods? Well, desirable characteristics of foods that are health supporting is that they're rich in antioxidants, that they're high in dietary fiber, they're alkalinizing, free of cholesterol, anti-inflammatory, rich in phytonutrients, and have a balanced, healthy set of macronutrients. Let's go through each of these and compare how plant foods and animal foods stack up. It turns out they did a study of over 3,100 different foods looking at the antioxidant content. They looked at everything from broccoli and lentils to cheeseburgers and Santa Claus beer. Um, you don't have to look at every detail though to see a, a, a clear pattern. The plant-based foods had an average content or a mean content of 1,157 units of antioxidants versus 18 for the animal. You see the difference in the maximum content as well. The plants make these antioxidants in order to survive the firestorm of photosynthesis. And if animals like cows, chickens, or pigs eat them, they use them for their own means and there's very little left in their meat, dairy, and eggs. Um, so here it is graphically, very little down here and high for the plant foods. These bioactive antioxidant phytochemicals are conserved in the fruits and vegetables. Why is this important? Well, it turns out that oxygen is a two-edged sword. It can help us to extract energy from carbohydrates and fats, uh, or it can cause oxidation and rust. 
And in fact, whenever we extract energy from food, these free radicals are formed. It's just inevitable. These are nasty little molecules with an unpaired electron that go around like a bull in a china shop, creating damage throughout your body. Um, they're highly reactive, forming DNA damage that could cause mutations and lead to cancer. Denaturing proteins, which um, makes them unrecognizable so that the immune system attacks them, causing chronic inflammation. They cause endothelial damage, that's the lining to our blood vessels, setting up for plaque and, and a collection of, of plaque in the arteries, setting us up for coronary artery disease and strokes, and cellular damage leading to accelerated cell aging and organ dysfunction. What's the answer to this? Well, antioxidants help to put out that firestorm, and these come naturally in the plant foods, as we talked about. Uh, examples include many vitamins, beta carotene, and thousands of other phytonutrients naturally present in, in plant-based foods. Um, one common question I get is, can't I just get them in a supplement? I saw antioxidants on a shelf. Unfortunately, it doesn't work this way. Uh, when they come with food, they come with thousands of other phytonutrients. And when you purify them out, mass produce them in a factory, they just don't work in the same way. In fact, you can get contrary effects in, in beta carotene and vitamin E studies actually showing worse outcomes by trying to purify them instead of getting them in food. So we'll put a big five star here in an X under and uh, animal foods for, uh, for uh, antioxidant richness. The next is high in fiber. When we say a woman is pregnant, we say she's eating for two. And in reality, we are all, all the time eating for 30 trillion and one. You're the one and there are 30 trillion or more little bacteria and other microorganisms, mostly in your colon, but throughout your system, living synergistically with you. You give them a ride and feed them and they provide for you many benefits. In fact, when you feed them well, they support immune function. They support hormone balance in your body, uh, manage toxins, nourish your colon uh, with short chain fatty acids, lower inflammation, produce nutrients, signal satiety, those same short chain fatty acids called butyrate get absorbed and go to the brain and say, hey, you ate, we ate too, we're good. Uh, providing nutrition and energy throughout critical parts of the body, and they aid in nutrient absorption. So they're not optional. These bacteria are present for all of us, and the better you take care of them, the better they take care of you. In contrast, if you starve them, they create inflammation. The bad guys grow, and a decreased diversity occurs. They actually produce toxins. They increase estrogen reabsorption, um, uh, setting uh, mostly women, but uh, all people up for uh, hormone imbalances, increase serum cholesterol, create inflammation in the gut where then substances call, uh, can leak across, causing le leaky gut and increase in the risk of autoimmune disease. So what does it mean to starve them and, or feed them? We need lots and lots of fiber in our diet. Uh, the average American only gets about 15 grams of dietary fiber. The dietary guidelines suggest we should get twice that in reality, the minimum goal should be 60 grams and optimal if we look at populations that are thriving best or what our ancestors ate, more than 100 grams a day. Where does it come from? Plant foods. You see zero in any animal foods. They don't have cell walls, they have cell membranes. Very little in processed foods like white bread, but as soon as you get to the whole grains, if you were to eat all only barley, you'd have over 60 grams uh, in your diet. Uh, avocado, blueberry, broccoli, and beans are all great sources of dietary fiber. And it's not to focus on these are better than these, it's the diversity, it's the number of different plant foods you eat that provide diversity in your microbiome and best support health. So here we have it, we talked about these foods starving your microbiome, these foods providing great nourishment and therefore uh, great health for you. We see this in, in uh, population studies as the amount of fiber in the diet goes up from five grams a day to the average American 15, and, and then on up from there, down goes the incidence of heart disease, breast cancer, and diabetes. Now, it's not only that the fiber itself is causing this. Fiber is a marker for a whole food plant-based diet. Since none in animal foods and very little in processed foods, this means people that are eating in that upper right-hand corner get all the benefits and therefore decreased chances of these very common diseases. 
uh, once again, you know the answer to this. If you're only taking one kind of fiber, you're only gonna support certain bacteria, decrease diversity. And while this may help for constipation, which is a symptom of fiber deficient diet, it doesn't really get to the crux of the matter that you want diversity, microbiome, healthy ones. So um, eat the fiber and you won't need to take the supplements because it doesn't really help you anyway. Let's put a big five star here and a zero under uh, animal foods. Next is alkaline. The acid load to the kidneys is very important for their long-term health. And these fish, pork, and poultry are high in, in two particular amino acids called cysteine and methionine. These amino acids contain sulfur and this metabolizes to sulfuric acid and that has to be buffered by ammonia in your kidney. And in the short run, it helps the kidneys to survive this metabolic acidosis. In the long run, it causes tubular damage and sets people up for chronic kidney disease. You see all the animal foods tend to be an acid uh, a load to the kidneys. The grains are about neutral and fruits and veggies, beans can help offset that for some, but best to eat over on this alkaline side to help preserve kidney function. Let's put a five star here for the uh, plant foods and an X for animal. The next is free of cholesterol. Cholesterol only occurs in animal foods. You see a zero here for all plant-based foods. Beef, chicken, fish are similar proportion size. Uh, eggs, dairy, and cheese are also high in cholesterol. Now, I know you saw this article back a while back that said, ah, oh, we had it wrong. Cholesterol is actually okay. And this was actually a series of studies, very poorly designed, but put forth by industry to try to um, put people uh, on the wrong track. It really was uh, poorly designed studies to suggest that cholesterol is really okay. And in reality, the higher the serum cholesterol, um, which comes from dietary cholesterol and saturated fat and animal protein, the higher the risk of coronary artery disease hypertension and stroke. So uh, don't be fooled by these studies. The goal should really be in er like areas of the world, rural China and rural Africa, where heart disease simply doesn't exist at less than 150 versus the average American of 210, 215. In fact, if you look at rural China, the serum cholesterol levels start about 80, peak at 127 and go up to 170. This is where America starts. Our best cholesterol numbers are really at the top end of where they should be with an average of 210 here. And as I mentioned, they have virtually no coronary artery disease in areas of the world where they eat like this. And in one study, even 10 year old kids in America had early signs, 100% of them had early signs of, of fatty streaks or early coronary disease already showing up. Uh, so even those who don't have a work coronary disease still have coronary image injury from the excessive cholesterol in our bloodstreams and, and other factors. Uh, so let's put uh, plant foods cholesterol free and uh, not so for animal foods. Next is anti-inflammatory. And we already talked about how antioxidants help quench inflammation and support for my microbiome. We're gonna come in a minute to phytonutrients, but in general, whole plant foods are anti-inflammatory. They help put out the inflammation in our systems. In contrast, animal foods have a number of things that create inflammation, one of which is bacterial endotoxins. Average quarter pounder has 100 million bacteria on it. And although these die in cooking, uh, not before they form these endotoxins, and these come from the intestines of the animals in the slaughterhouse. Um, so these are nasty bacteria that form toxins that survive cooking. The saturated fats in the, uh, are in, along with them that come in the, in the food, meat, dairy, and eggs, aid the absorption, and they accelerate atherosclerosis and insulin resistance, that's prediabetes, uh, throughout our bodies. The next is arachidonic acid. This is the substance our own bodies use to create inflammation when we need it. If you step on a nail or get a splinter or a scrape, your body brings arachidonic acid to instigate the inflammatory cascade and bring out white blood cells, blood flow, and inflammation to start that antibacterial uh, action and uh, healing process. Well, plants don't have arachidonic acid, but other animals do, especially if you're a chicken cooped up in a small cage with several others. And that arachidonic acid goes into the chicken meat and eggs. It's also present in beef and other meats as well, but this is the worst part here. So when you eat chicken and eggs, you're just eating the messenger for inflammation, which courses throughout your body and your bloodstream. 
The next is heme iron. We used to think this was the preferable form of iron because in the diet, because it's almost 100% absorbed. However, it turns out that this iron is actually a pro-oxidant, not only meat uh, devoid of antioxidants, this substance within here, uh, like with, uh, uh, when you metabolize the energy from food, uh, is a pro-oxidant and creates inflammation and free, uh, free radicals throughout the body. Uh, enough so that for each one milligram of heme iron in the diet, the risk of diabetes goes up by 16%, heart disease 27%, stroke, um, colon, breast, and lung cancer, also significant increases for each milligram of heme iron. Now, it's not hard to get a milligram, especially in these shellfish, uh, you can see large amounts of heme iron per three ounce portion, but even most red meats, two to three uh, milligrams, sometimes 16 or 27 percent, you can see significant increase from this factor uh, of uh, pro-inflammation. The next is carnitine in meat and choline in eggs, which are metabolized by the bacteria in the gut of people who eat meat and eggs to a substance called trimethylamine. This is oxidized in the liver to trimethylamine oxide. And again, bad actor. You can measure TMAO, TMAO levels go up two to three hours after an egg McMuffin meal and stiffening of arteries go increase right before your eyes on ultrasound. So inflammation and chronic disease are the downstream costs of eating uh, the carnitine and, and uh, excess choline in eggs. Here it is in the New England Journal of Medicine. These foods go in the front door, got flora, metabolites, atherosclerosis, stroke, heart attack, and death. Um, so we're learning that inflammation is really the common factor for many of the most common chronic diseases. They're really just different manifestations of this pro-inflammatory diet that the average American and has. Uh, Time Magazine here is talking about that link between inflammation. So let's put plant foods as anti-inflammatory and food, animal foods as quite pro-inflammatory. And this is part of the reason that they're so good at, at stimulating chronic disease. Next is phytonutrients. Plants contain over 30,000, maybe as many as 100,000 disease-preventing phytonutrients. Bioflavonoids and citrus, lycopene in tomatoes, phytates and beans, isoflavones in soy, carotenoids and carrots and, and sweet potatoes. And these are not optional. It's not just the macronutrients and vitamins and minerals. These also help to support immune function, to help us to heal, to help us to, to grow where necessary. To these, these phytonutrients are essential for our health. And phyto means plants, so they only occur in plants. So here, uh, not in animal foods. And finally, balanced healthy macronutrients. In areas of the world of blue zones where they live longest and healthiest, um, their diets are about 80% complex carbs, not the sugar and sweet and refined carbs like we have, and about 10 to 15% fat and protein. You can see animal and plant and uh, uh, meat, dairy, and eggs are really just all either fats or protein foods. Uh, they don't have the complex carbs. And let's kind of look a little more um, detail at this uh, by looking at each one. Uh, the protein, uh, it turns out, is we, we think of, or many people think of meat as synonymous with protein. In reality, as I said, red meat is actually 60 to 70% fat. It's not even a protein food, but it's a fat food with an, a little bit of protein. And you can't be very long plant-based before people ask you, where do you get your protein? Figuring you're going to shrivel up and die of protein malnutrition because it's got to come from, from meat, right? Well, it's quiz time. Which of these have protein? I'm sure many of you at this talk know the answer, all of them. Uh, DNA codes for protein. So every cell of every apple, of every broccoli, of every bean, of every piece of quinoa or brown rice have protein and in more than adequate amounts. We only need about five to 10% of our calories from protein. So as long as you're meeting your calorie needs with whole plant foods, you're generously exceeding your protein needs. And not only that, but all eight of the essential amino acids. But it goes beyond that. The protein in animal foods is more acidic, uh, as we talked about, um, which uh, we talked about in, in with respect to the sulfur-containing amino acids. More allergenic, especially dairy and eggs, these are the two leading causes of food allergy. The animal protein itself is pro-inflammatory, inducing interleukins, uh, raising 
C-reactive protein levels and stimulating inflammatory cytokines throughout the body and especially in the brain. And they stimulate a hormone called IGF-1, which uh, fans the flames of cancer wherever it might occur. Uh, so plant proteins are much superior in terms of health promoting quality. Um, we used to think that it was animal fat as the root of all evil. So ding, industry to the rescue. They came up with low fat cottage cheese, fat free ballpark franks, I don't know how you do that. Egg beaters and skim milk, supposedly eliminating the fat and making these foods healthy, not recognizing that the protein also now is not healthy for us, stimulating especially colon, breast, and prostate cancer, osteoporosis, and chronic kidney disease. In fact, animal protein also raises serum cholesterol, so it contributes to this side of the equation as well. In this uh, population study, respondents in middle age, um, those with the highest protein intake had a 400% increase in cancer death over the following 18 years, uh, and a 75% increase in overall mortality. Um, excess protein is not healthy for us. Animal protein in particular is toxic to humans. And I don't mean acute toxicity, like you're gonna eat it and, and have trouble within the next uh, uh, even day or month. It's a long-term chronic effect that this acidity and inflammation plays on our system uh, that creates this over time. Uh, next is fats. We already talked about all animal foods. If you only want cholesterol, it's a waxy-like fat. They're much higher in saturated fats. Uh, we'll come to that. They have naturally occurring trans fats. These are the ones that the FDA banned in processed foods because they recognize that they increase risk of cancer and heart disease. And the fat is these where animals sequester heavy metals and contaminants. So especially in seafood, high in uh, animal fats tend to be high in heavy metals and contaminants versus the opposite for plant food uh, fats. Uh, you may also remember though, the Time Magazine came out and said, nope, we were all wrong. Actually saturated fat is better. Once again, poorly designed studies comparing people on a high saturated fat diet with a very high saturated fat diet and noticing there was no difference. And the example there is that if you compare people smoking a pack and a half a day versus people smoking a pack and three quarters a day, their cancer and rates of COPD are about the same. So you could conclude that smoking doesn't matter, right? No, when you do that, it comes out with flawed conclusions. In fact, saturated fat is not only implicated in heart disease, but also strokes, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, breast, prostate cancer, enhancing that trimethylamine absorption and Alzheimer's disease. So bad actor. And finally, carbs. Animal foods have almost none, except for milk, which has sugar, uh, and that's in the form of lactose. Um, this metabolizes to galactose, which is not a healthy sugar. Um, in contrast, plant foods are rich in complex carbohydrates, are a green burning energy source, high in fiber to feed our microbiome, and don't have a lactose, only small amounts of galactose. So a much superior form of carbohydrates. We can say that the protein quantities and qualities are better, fats also, and carbs. And we can use this to go then fill in our final table, five star here and a big X over here. Are we noticing a pattern here? Um, is it just a coincidence that these health promoting characteristics were all present in plant foods and, and the opposite health degrading for animal? No, it's not. The, these are the foods that our ancestors evolved on. It was 98 plus percent plant-based with only small amounts of insects or animal foods. And, and therefore our bodies are ideally designed to thrive on these foods versus these foods that can drag us down. So here's the summary. Um, plant foods uh, very health supporting and animals at foods actually the opposite. Um, there's one more thing to mention now, especially in this age of pandemic uh, uh, is that in a national retail survey, 90% of retail chicken showed evidence of contaminated with fecal matter. The fecal matter from the chickens in the slaughterhouse. It's just inevitable when you put them through that, that it's gonna get onto the chicken carcass. Um, it's not just chicken though, and ground turkey was 91%, ground beef 88, and uh, pork chops 88%. And 48 million plus people are sickened annually from salmonella, mostly in uh, chicken and eggs, uh, from Yersinia, from E. coli, 
uh, you, you've heard about these. And by the way, when you get an outbreak of E. coli from spinach or romaine lettuce, it, they, they didn't come from that. It was animal feed, uh, animal uh, runoff that got into the irrigation water. Uh, spinach doesn't poop. Uh, so it's the animal waste that got onto those and created the havoc. Uh, there's one other factor in, in terms of infection, and that's the bovine leukemia virus. We used to think this didn't matter because bovine is a cow virus, um, and, but it gets into the milk. And now uh, virtually um, 80 to 100% of dairy cows are infected with this virus. Um, now we have discovered uh, through histologic studies of breast cancer that the DNA from this leukemia virus is stitched into as many as 37% of breast cancers. Um, just like HPV causes cervical cancer uh, and uh, HIV can cause Kaposi sarcoma, we know that many cancers can be induced by viruses. We now have direct evidence that this bovine leukemia virus present in uh, rare red meat and uh, dairy products um, may be a, a significant risk factor for breast cancer. So let's come back up then and finish our table here and say, well, what we're left with if we're looking for optimal vitality and health is this quarter unprocessed plant foods, whole food plant-based. That is new for our food groups of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans with a scattering of some nuts and seeds. Um, so what does this all mean for people with an interest in optimal health? Um, I know I've covered a lot and I talk fast, so... Take a 10 second stretch break here. <laughs> Step to your arms, take a breath, uh, and let's get ready for part two. Uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, we're gonna make it and still have time for questions. This is Karen. Uh, she saw a talk much like this one one time, one of my patients, and decided to go whole food plant-based. And over the next 10 months, lost 34 pounds. But more importantly, her diabetes, which had been significantly out of control. This A1C is a measure of diabetes control. And over seven is, is diabetes, is out of control. Over 6.5 is diabetes. Over that period of 10 months, her diabetes reversed. It, it went away. Um, this is Tim, another one of my patients. Uh, Tim's a, a uh, came in for a, a health, phys, health maintenance visit uh, in uh, October of uh, 2017. Um, I'm sorry, November. And we did some tests here. Tim was a little bit overweight, 27, not quite obese. His blood pressure was borderline, not at a measure we would use medications. His fasting blood sugar was 104. That's pre-diabetes, not until it gets to 125 is it diabetes. Cholesterol 206 and an elevated LDL cholesterol also. Um, I looked at him and I said, Tim, these numbers are, you know, quote, not bad by American standards, but these put you at significant risk for heart disease, strokes, high blood pressure. I said, you got to make some changes. And I, I gave him a book uh, called How Not to Die. I'll come back to that. Uh, and, and Tim, he, you know, he, he looked at it. He started deciding uh, that he was going to make some changes, um, but not quite fast enough. Um, you see, Tim's a healthcare consultant, and he was uh, doing a consultation down at Detroit Medical Center, uh, and uh, they were talking about uh, healthcare cost uh, uh, projecting and how they could help keep people and workers healthy. And, and one of the uh, docs there looked at him and said, Tim, you're approaching 60. You're a good test for what we're talking about. How's your health? He said, I'm good. I had my physical, my doc said, a few things a little borderline, but, but I'm good. I feel good. I Well, I, I do have a little kind of shortness of breath when I go for a run, especially in the winter. I, I don't know. I call it my asthma. I'm just getting a little wheezy. And he said, Tim, what's it like? He said, well, it goes better when I rest. He said, Tim, you need a stress test. And, I, and he talked him into going to get a stress test uh, that next day. They, they, they were suspicious enough of concern that they did what's called a coronary angiogram. And this... Uh, this is the artery from his left anterior descending. You can see 90% narrowed. This is called the widow maker. Tim had atherosclerotic plaque built up in this artery here that was nearly occluding that. Um, and so these quote, okay numbers uh, over the years of the standard American diet have left Tim at significant risk. 
Um, we'll come back at the end to uh, follow up on his story. But really what we wanna do is shift from this idea that diet doesn't matter that much to address the root cause of chronic disease and support healing from within. Because it turns out that all of these common diseases I see in my office every day, diabetes, strokes, arthritis, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, uh, diverticulosis, are all have a roots in our diet. Uh, other factors too, including smoking, uh, stress, lack of sleep, but most importantly, the diet. And so they therefore should be called more appropriately foodborne chronic disease, because in the absence of the wrong food, just like if you don't eat salmonella tainted chicken or eggs, it's very rare to get salmonella. If you don't eat the foods that cause these problems, it's rare to get these diseases. Uh, so we're looking at and seeing a fundamental paradigm shift. I call this plant-based healthcare, which is a Division of Lifestyle Medicine. And a big part of helping people to see this is to help discover their why. Um, for me, I, I love to be adventurous. This is me shooting uh, over the ocean in Cabo on a thing called a, a flyboard. Um, let's see if I can get this video to work. Um, somebody asked me what I was holding on to here. That's just a GoPro. Uh, it's the uh, stick that had the camera on it. This guy in the jet ski over here is controlling uh, the amount of forest and that he's taken me up to 10 or 15 feet above the ocean. Uh, and this is what I do for fun. I like to climb mountains and rollerblades and uh, uh, ski and uh, scuba dive. Um, and to each their own though, um, this is my wife over here safely on the beach. You can see her there. Uh, and that's fine. It's, it's Everybody should do whatever they want. But the point is without your vitality, you don't have the ability to do what it is you want to do. Um, sorry, let me get this back into presentation mode. Uh, and yeah, I'm on PowerPoint. There we go. So understand the importance of truly nourishing food as key. And as I mentioned, tens of thousands of study document that we do know this now. And one important key is that an ounce of prevention is worth much more than a pound of cure. We learned this especially with seatbelts. Um, as seatbelt laws came into place in the 80s and 90s, down went the fatality rate. Now we also had, you know, jaws of life and level one trauma centers, many other factors, but it was largely the seatbelt use that we attributed this dramatic drop. And now thousands of more people are alive that would not have been had we not done that simple measure. So what we're talking about here now is a seatbelt for your fork. Um, we learned this too with cancer. As smoking rates rose over the years and peaked in 1963 at the Surgeon General's report, uh, dropping back down with a, about a 30 year lag, lung cancer rates went up and up and up and then also started back down. So the area here under this curve represents deaths prevented. Had we not had that Surgeon General's report and people kept smoking or even increasing, all these people would have died with, along with countless morbidity. So what's, what has replaced smoking now as the leading cause of death and disability since 2018 now, the American diet. It's because smoking rates have decreased and our diet has become even more processed and horrible. So this is now the leading cause of disability. Uh, this is also quite personal to me with my story of Uncle Don. Um, Uncle Don was everybody's favorite uncle was just four years ago on the 4th of July with my, me and my wife, uh, Don's uh, son, Scott. Unfortunately, three months later after this, Uncle Don was dead of, of uh, colon cancer, um, a, a largely preventable disease. Um, uh, Dr. O'Keefe reported uh, after years of research out of the University of Pittsburgh that a change from the Western diet to a fiber-rich diet has the potential to reduce colon cancer 20 to 40 fold. That's not 20 to 40 percent, that's 95 to 97 percent decrease in colon cancer rates, our second leading cause of cancer caused by what we eat. The next thing I ask new doctors to join our group is diabetes reversible? Most of them kind of hedge and think, well, maybe partly, but only a few get the right answer that, yes, it is. Uh, this is Antoine, uh, came to me one day and his hemoglobin A1C was wildly out of control. That should be less than 6.5. His fasting blood sugar should be less than 100. Cholesterol should be less than 150. 
uh, triglycerides 150 and microbial less than 30. That's a sign of kidney damage. I gave him the ultimatum. By the way, it had been this way for over a year. I gave him the ultimatum and said, Antoine, you either have to go on a whole food plant-based diet or you have to uh, you have to go on insulin. He said, doc, don't like needles. I'm going to do the diet. Well, four months later, A1C, normal. Fasting, blood sugar, nearly normal. Cholesterol down over 100 points. Uh, triglycerides dropped almost 600 points. Microalbumin down to normal. His diabetes went away when he got out of the way. Here he is uh, three years later, down 30 pounds, still eating healthy. And that's the power of plant-based eating. Instead of medications that just mitigate it, um, plant-based eating has the power to reverse. What's going on here? In type 2 diabetes, people make plenty of insulin, um, but it's ineffective. The sugar builds up in the bloodstream, and therefore the cells are starving in the face of plenty. Um, what's gumming this up? It's the fat, in particular the saturated fat that leads to what's called intramyocellular lipid inside the liver and muscle cells, getting in the way of that insulin signaling process and causing diabetes. Um, where is this coming from? Well, back when I was a kid, the average per capita intake of chicken was about 15 pounds per year. And then came the kernel, uh, and it's over 50 pounds per person per year now. Not only that, but they've obesified chickens uh, four times the size to market in half the time. So their profits are up 800 percent, but so is the amount of chicken uh, fat in a chicken breast from two to three, up to over 23 grams per chicken breast. So even white meat chicken breast without the skin is a high saturated fat food. Secondly is cheese. Uh, back used to be a small amount, of pizza hot, and almost everything now, over 30 pounds per person per year. And since I ate none, that means somebody's eating 66 pounds. Um, this also 70% fat loaded with saturated fat, salt, and animal protein. Um, so here's the graph of US um, adults with diabetes uh, growing up, uh, up and up. And uh, although correlation doesn't uh, necessarily uh, imply causation, in this case, since we now know the mechanism, it is indeed true that chicken and cheese intake are key drivers of our diabetes epidemic and all the morbidity and mortality that goes along with it. Uh, diabetes is, is reversible. Uh, Dr. Barnard's book, Reversing Diabetes, and many others have shown there's ways to do this. This is type 2 diabetes, by the way. Type 1 is a different issue. Um, but even that is not the leading cause of death. It's dwarfed by heart disease, circulatory disorders, and cancer. We already mentioned colon cancer, many others uh, as well, including breast and prostate, but heart and circulatory disorders are the biggest. What about this? Why does our arteries clog with plaque starting at as, as young as before we're born? Um, well, this too, as I said, is saturated fat, cholesterol, animal protein, and chronic inflammation, microbiome dysbiosis. And it too, in reality, is a benign foodborne illness which need never exist or progress. This is Dr. Esselstein from the Cleveland Clinic. And if you've seen the documentary, Forks Over Knives, it tells his story and you'll see how he's putting this to use to help save lives. Here's an example of a 43-year-old surgeon from the Cleveland Clinic who had a ragged artery here on an angiogram and three years later, uh, completely opened up, reversing his coronary artery disease. Uh, Paul Chatlin uh, also did this with his own uh, late stage coronary disease, and went on to found a group called Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group. We'll come back to that in a little bit too. Even multiple sclerosis, uh, my patient Colleen reversed hers with a whole food plant-based eating. Dr. Sarai Stanzik reversed her multiple sclerosis and made a documentary called Code Blue Dog. I encourage you to look at it with respect to all kinds of autoimmune diseases, including MS. Now, this doesn't mean it's always reversible, and the earlier you catch it, the better, uh, but in her case, she was eight years with gradually progressive MS and now run, ran a marathon and teaches lifestyle medicine, practicing it too. Dr. Brooke Goldner reversed her lupus, wrote the book Goodbye Lupus, later won Goodbye Autoimmune Disease. So many of these were also uh, largely preventable and commonly reversible with good diet. Uh, so if you want to solve a problem or seeing the theme, get to the root cause. If you have this in your backyard and you don't like it, Unless you get to the root, you're going to end up with this. Um, 
this is George, he's 84. He said, Doc, I feel great. He came in one day, I watched that Forks movie. And uh, these are George's numbers. His weight down, went down from obese to normal. His blood pressure dropped on medications, high down to normal. His bad cholesterol dropped to the normal range. Good cholesterol went up, triglycerides significantly. Most importantly, even at his age, his vitality went from low to excellent. No more side effects of medications, able to enjoy life much more. What's going on here is that hypertension is not really a heart problem, it's a blood vessel problem. As they stiffen from the chronic inflammation, the heart has to work harder to push blood through it. The only way to do that is to raise the pressure. Um, so we see hypertension as epidemic in our country. Over half people now with hypertension or prehypertension, whereas it's rare in places with plant-based health cultures. Um, here it's a disease, hypertension. We treat it with medications that are only have fair effectiveness, um, moderate cost, and still get complications of stroke and heart disease. People uh, living in this lifestyle rarely have high blood pressure uh, and don't suffer the need for intervention or complications. And why is this? Well, coronary vascular disease, uh, uh, chronic kidney disease and, and strokes uh, are commonly, how many heard that he had a stroke because he had hypertension. Well, we're stopping there and saying that's the cause when the real cause goes much deeper to arterial stiffening from the endothelial damage, inflammation, oxidative stress, animal protein from meat, dairy, and eggs, and processed foods. Um, we stop here and treat it with medication because that's what pays, but the reality is we should dig deeper and get to the root cause. Um, I don't wanna just focus on chronic disease either. There's also a positive wellness side to things. When people nourish themselves better, their minds and bodies work better, they look, feel, and perform better. And there's a great documentary on this called The Game Changers, now available on Netflix, documenting elite athletes switching to plant-based diets and not only improving performance times and, and outcomes, but also recovery time is one of the big things because their muscles are not chronically inflamed and stiffened from decreased blood flow and impaired performance. Uh, from all these uh, components inherent in the high meat, dairy, egg, and processed food diets, they perform better as well. Um, and many, many examples of this. So whole food plant-based uh, uh, are the opposite, giving athletes everything they need to perform better. And even people who just want to go for walks with their grandkids or uh, enjoy uh, swimming. Uh, you want to be able to do what you want to do. So the bottom line, um, you want to eat as if your life uh, and your health depend on it, because they do. Um, this is my common, or say everyday breakfast. On weekends, we commonly have different things, but I start with steel cut oats and some goji berries, pop it in the microwave for uh, two and a half minutes while I take my shower, add some turmeric, cinnamon, pumpkin pie spice, top with ground flaxseed and whatever berries I have. Uh, it just becomes delicious. It's, it's fun. It's, it's rich in antioxidants. This is very anti-inflammatory. The omega-3s in the, in the, in the ground flaxseed are great for us. And it just starts the day out right. For lunch, this is a quinoa sweet potato with salad, a balsamic vinegar, uh, tasty, flavorful, colorful, high in fiber. You see the colors, eat the rainbow. Uh, lunch may be soups or stews left over from the night before. Uh, dinner, we love to grill in the summer, just leave off the uh, the animals and, and the eggs from the grill uh, and uh, grilled asparagus, broccoli, uh, pineapple, uh, portobello mushrooms. Um, this is my daughter's miso stew, not just a couple of sprigs of, of uh, uh, water chestnuts and tofu, but uh, hearty with uh, vegetables. So you can put kale and cabbage, um, uh, dinners that are colorful, flavorful, tasty, fun. Um, and, and before we finish, I just want to mention two other things quickly. In addition to being better for ourselves and our health, there's another component to human health, and that's called our Earth. Uh, we live in this thin little layer here called the biosphere, within which all known life in the universe exists. Uh, and if the Earth were the size of the basketball, it would be the thickness of a sheet of plastic. And we are not taking good care of it. It turns out one of the most important and best ways to help do that is to eat whole food plant-based because instead of the waste of feeding, watering grains, 
uh, feeding them to animals, slaughtering animals, eating animals. We save, for each day, each person saves 1,100 gallons of water, 45 pounds of grain, 30 square feet of forest, especially the Amazon, 10 pounds of carbon dioxide, and one animal's life. And speaking of that last one, I know this is dear and dear to many of Badge Michigan fans, but uh, uh, folks, but we see this on the grill. And what we forget is behind that are sentient beings who have the capacity to feel pain and suffering, who, who care for their young, who mourn, who have emotions. And it, it's, it's really, it's just not right the way we're treating these animals on factory farms. So another benefit of eating in this manner is for the animals. Some additional resources for you. I encourage everybody to watch Forks Over Knives. Um, look up these uh, organizations. So you can take a screenshot here or with your phone camera. <coughs> uh, great organizations with a lot of resources and references uh, for both the science and the how-to and recipes. I especially like Dr. Greger, his book, How Not to Die, is the best I've seen for a review of lifestyle medicine. Uh, you can listen to it. Uh, his website, nutritionfacts.org, posts over 2,000 videos on almost any topic you could look at. Join the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group. This uh, is a group of over 9,000 folks now na nationwide with virtual seminars, much like this one on the science, cooking classes, and, and uh, assistance in a community approach to, to going plant-based. And that's Paul Chaplin I mentioned earlier. Um, and to also recognize that this is also part of a broader food revolution that's just building momentum by the week. Uh, remember this graph I showed you? Well, right toward the end there, there's a, a definite and significant downtick in chicken uh, consumption with an, a 12% decline in per capita uh, meat consumption just from 2007 to 2012. So we're seeing a, people catch on to the fact that this is better for them, better for the environment and better for the animals. Um, finally, uh, this quote by George Bernard Shaw, there's no love sincerer than the love of food. And for this, I caution you that your newfound knowledge may inspire you, but just be careful that you don't go hit your friends and family over the head with it and say, that chicken's going to kill you. That's not the way to go for it. The way to do it is to experience it yourself, to share your experience. They want, they'll see your vitality, your improved health, your weight loss if you need to. They'll see that and then they'll want a part of it and they'll be asking you. So make sure that uh, just like the love of a puppy dog, uh, and uh, sometimes when an animal loves its food, a uh, uh, nice herbivore, uh, you're, you're sharing appropriately. And then um, my last story is Alice. She came in three weeks ago um, for a Medicare wellness visit. And my medical assistant said, uh, she, there's a, a person in room eight and she, she doesn't really need anything. She just wants to say goodbye. And I said, what? And, and I walked in, I recognized Alice. She's She's 68, she, she's retiring. She said, Dr. Brakey, I just wanna thank you. I'm retiring and moving to Traverse City. Uh, you started with my doc, as my doctor when we were both just young. And at that time you inspired me to go plant-based in my eating. And look at me now, I'm, I'm normal weight. I'm on no medicines. I've got no health problems. I get to retire and go enjoy my family and my gardening. I just wanna thank you for having given me a better life. Uh, and I said, you know, I said, Thank you, Alice. It makes it all worth it because I do spend more time with people. I enjoy sharing this with people. And it's especially inspiring when I see people like her who take it to heart, who make a lifestyle change and then experience and share the benefits. So I wish all the best for you as well. Uh, when you have your health, you have a thousand dreams. And when you don't, you have just one. Um, this is me and my wife in Sedona. We love to travel uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all at some future seminars so we can get back together live. Um, how did we do on time, Olivia? Uh, oh, we're close on time, but still time for some questions. Did I stimulate any questions out there? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, thank you so much. That was excellent. Uh, we do have some questions, so let's get right into them. So, Susie said, curious, I am a 60 year old female that has a slight build and at one time been diagnosed with osteopenia, osteoporosis. Uh, I do not want to take any drugs for it. I'm concerned about becoming vegetarian and not getting enough nutrients. So not to lose weight and to maintain healthy bones. I do exercise daily. 
Do you have any concerns or recommendations? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Uh, as I mentioned, osteoporosis is epidemic in our country, but very uncommon in countries where they eat whole food plant-based. Um, it turns out that osteoporosis has several risk factors. One, don't smoke, no excess alcohol, make sure you get weight-bearing exercise. These are critical parts. And then vitamin D, if you're not getting enough sunlight, and in Michigan, that's pretty common, uh, one or 2,000 units of vitamin D helps with calcium absorption. Um, on the food side of it, though, contrary to popular opinion, uh, it's not a calcium deficiency disease. It's really more of a protein excess, especially animal protein. Remember how we talked about animal protein is very acidic. Well, the body has to balance that with calcium and phosphorus from the bones. So those high animal protein diets pull calcium from the bones uh, and then flush it down the toilet. With a, with, when you double your protein intake, your calcium excretion goes up by 50%. Um, and over the long run, that leads to the osteoporosis. Um, milk and dairy products do not help prevent osteoporosis uh, in many studies now. Uh, again, contrary to dairy industry, um, marketing campaign and popular belief. Uh, so your best bet is to do what, what you're doing. Um, and again, um, remember since you are slight of build, you don't need as strong or as dense of bones. Uh, a, a giraffe doesn't need as much bone density as an elephant does. Um, and similarly different people develop bone density based on their need. Uh, that said, uh, by eating whole food, plant-based, uh, getting good quality protein from beans, whole grains, and vegetables, you'll optimize your uh, chances of preventing further decline uh, along with those other things. Thanks for that question. That was great. Very nice. Um, okay, James says, any recommendations to those of us who are sometimes overwhelmed by sweet and salty cravings? <laughs> yes. You know, th this is normal. You have to begin to remember that our ancestors lived in times without processed foods. Um, and uh, on the savanna of Africa, we need sodium. We need salt in our bodies. And natural foods contain small amounts. But we had cravings for that because that's what helped people to get the sodium they needed from the food. Uh, nowadays, of course, we're overwhelmed with sodium in foods. By the way, big amounts injected into, into meat, especially chicken, because that increases the weight and they sell it by the pound. So one of the leading uh, sources of, of uh, sodium in our diet is chicken, uh, meat, and cheese. They use salt to stop the fermentation process for cheese. Uh, in addition to processed foods. Only 8% comes from the salt shaker. Um, so watch out for sodium in things. It really is um, uh, not, not good for you. Uh, but to back to your question, that and sugar, uh, again, there were no processed foods back then, but when our ancestors found um, you know, wild blueberries or fruits that were naturally sweet, it's like, yes, this is going to be healthy for me, stimulates dopamine, gives them a pleasure center reward, helps them remember where to find it again. Um, and so what food industry have done, have hijacked that natural craving and processed those things into very addictive foods. Um, so you the first step is that is understanding. It's not that you're weak, it's that you're normal. That's how humans are. Now there are more or less of that. Um, and the next step for that is to, um, if you need to, like any, um, thing you're, you're attached to that much, you may need to find alternatives uh, that are still sweet and you can make uh, great brownies with dates. Um, you can get the natural sweetness in fruits. Uh, you can find alternatives that are whole food plant-based uh, that will help you for that. Um, you may need to cut down gradually over a couple of weeks. Um, but the other cool thing is that once you're away from it for about two to three weeks, your cravings improve. I'm not saying they won't will go away. I'm not saying that if you start up again, they won't start right back over where you were. Um, but once you get away from it, your tastes actually improve, your taste buds in your brain improve to the point where uh, you no longer have such strong cravings. So uh, go for it, it's worth it. Uh, you, you'll lose weight, you'll improve your overall health uh, and uh, you won't have as many cavities in your teeth either. <laughs> Naomi says, how do beyond beef, beyond beef and impossible beef fit into a plant-based diet? What do you think about these? 
Yeah, great question. Um, in all ways, these are better than the real thing. Um, the Impossible Burger and uh, Beyond Meat uh, are plant-based sources that are meant to mimic and help people who are trying to transition. And uh, again, when you look at it from animal, at least no animals were harmed in that regard. Uh, they're better for the environment, not as much waste, and they're better in terms of health because at least they don't have uh, the um, as much of the pesticides, uh, some of the carnitine, uh, choline, other things. Now, on the other side of that, they are heavily processed. They're down in that lower white quadrant of my square there, and they're very high in saturated fat, 10 to 12 grams of saturated fat from plant-based sources, but still saturated fat. So call them uh, less worse than meat, um, not above the line health promoting. On the other hand, if someone is looking for incremental progress, there's certainly better that than eating a, a cheeseburger or uh, real red meat. Uh, uh, I should say red meat that comes from an animal. Absolutely. Um, okay, Lori says, I think she had a question about uh, your breakfast that you showed. She said, oats, turmeric, what, and pumpkin pie spice? Cinnamon. <laughs> Cinnamon. Cinnamon? Yeah. Is that yeah. Okay, that's basically. That's the other, that, that was the other spice, yeah. I, I actually pre-mixed those with the ground flax seeds, so it's very okay. cool. In the morning, I just put the oats and the goji berries. Goji berries are kind of like little dried red raisins. Uh, they cook and plump up with that. Uh, they're one of the highest antioxidant content of any of the berries. Uh, you can order them online. Uh, you can use raisins if you prefer, uh, but, but they're good. And then those three spices just add some great flavor to it for me. And uh, they're very also rich in antioxidants. And again, turmeric, both anti-cancer and uh, anti-inflammatory um, in large part due to the uh, cur curcumin, but also other components in turmeric. You can also get fresh turmeric root um, chop it up and put it in your oatmeal or your stews and soups, your curries, uh, or your smoothies as well. Actually, right with that, uh, someone said, how much turmeric do you put in your oatmeal? Do you have like a recommended amount? Oh, yeah. you, you know, I just, I just use about a half teaspoon. I don't really even measure, <laughs> but, uh, um, just anything added is great. Yeah. A half teaspoons enough to get many of those benefits and, okay, and, and again, put it in other things too, through the day. Definitely. Okay, uh, Jeannie says, what is the best way to transition to plant-based? No, that can be challenging. I don't know if you have any tips. Well, yeah, great question. And that's a common one too, is that uh, for most people, it is good to go gradual. Uh, and even for myself back in 1977, I gave up red meat in, in March and chicken at my brother's wedding in August and seafood in December. And then it was dairy a, a few years later when I learned more about that. You know, at that time, we didn't know as much. I didn't recognize. And I, I, I think today, today's day, I would work to go, to go faster than that. But the point is, everybody's on a journey. Um, and for most people, it is uh, best to kind of make gradual transition and to add rather than take away. To say, hey, I'm going to make sure in every day eat two fruits and a big salad. Uh, uh, I'm going to, you know, next week I'm going to do the Dr. Brakey oatmeal three times a week. Uh, the next day I'm going to substitute one bread meat dish for one bean dish, a bean burrito for a red meat burrito. And you'll find yourself exploring and finding things you like gradually over time. And pretty soon you'll, you'll gain a taste for it that helps you to stick with it. Um, it, it. Another reason for that is that plant foods being high in fiber can for some people be a little more gas farming. It's just different bacteria and different enzymes that digest it. So if you go all of a sudden, you may feel gassy, bloated, uh, even a little loose stool. And I've had a, a, a number of people come and say, oh, I tried that. I felt horrible. You know, I, I got all gassy. No, it didn't work for me. Don't like it. Well, they were just in that two twig transition phase. Um, and that does go away uh, over time. So good reasons to transition um, uh, gradually for most people. Now, there's two exceptions to that. One is those with a teachable moment that's really urgent. Uh, Paul Chatlin, I mentioned, was literally on the gurney going in for quadruple bypass surgery. And, and he switched, you know, from horrible standard American diet. And now, you know, all these years later has not touched anything um, animal or other because he was literally kind of gun to the head. If you've got something that's saying, hey, you're, you're you know, just 
about to have a stroke, you're just, you know, you're going to head for a heart attack. You just got a diagnosis of cancer. That's where you get, might want to say, okay, I'm just going to do this. Um, and the second thing is take stock of yourself. Um, just like some people can quit smoking cold turkey and some have to cut down, works better one or the other. Some people, if they just cut down, they're still getting what they, 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 they and they sneak back and they can never quite do it. And they may at some point need to just say, okay, here's the day, <laughs> this day I'm going all in. Um, if you are interested in an all in approach to get the fastest results, there's a great program called uh, Jumpstart uh, through Love's Rochester Lifestyle Medicine. If you just Google Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Jumpstart, um, their 15 day program uh, teaches you not only the, the why, but the how. How do I shop? How do I cook without oil? How do I um, go out to dinner? How do I have friends over? How do I make it through the holidays? How do I make it tasty? So I will want to stick with it. And people in this program are noticing six to eight pound weight loss in two weeks, drops in cholesterol, an average of 44 points in two weeks, some as many as 100 points. They're getting the benefits fast enough that they say, wow, to me, that's good to helping me stick with it because my benefits are so apparent to me that I'm never going back. So there are different things for different people, um, but yeah, great question. And it's not just one right answer. Absolutely, great tips. Okay, uh, Diane says, my husband had a calcium CT and his score was high. He's been vegan now for more than two years. Do you recommend a repeat of that calcium CT scan? And if so, how long after going plant-based? Yeah, the coronary CT scan can tell, it's a test that tells what amount of calcium is in the arteries and that correlates uh, to a certain extent with uh, for hardening of the arteries and the plaque buildup. Um, uh, it is likely he's still going to have some there forever because I don't know how old he is, but after years or decades of diet, it doesn't change that much. And it turns out that if you're really whole food plant-based, not just vegan, and again, remember, it's easy to be a, uh, a junk food vegan with French fries, Oreos, and Coca-Cola. Uh, so uh, and I assume you're meaning he's whole food plant-based, not just vegan. Um, the more he sticks with that, the less important it becomes that you check things like that because the arteries heal and they've stabilized and even the calcium that's there doesn't tend to rupture or cause troubles. Um, so I, I don't know, again, I can't answer in particular for his situation but there's not just a hard and fast answer that he needs to repeat it after a certain amount of time. Um, work on uh, whole food plant-based eating, not only now, but for the future. Uh, and that will be your best way to reverse whatever coronary uh, disease is in there. In addition to exercise, adequate sleep, managing stress, you know, the, the nutrition's the part I focus most on, but all components of lifestyle medicine are also important. Sure, of course. Um, okay, Perry says, so doctor, you're saying the only way we can be healthy is to quit consuming animal products. So there's no <laughs> level of eating animal products that is healthy. Um, so thank you for asking that. Uh, this is not all or nothing. I don't want to make perfect the enemy of good. Um, any uh, amount, in fact, even replacing one meat meal a week with a bean meal gives incremental benefit. Uh, and it's not whether you will definitely be healthy or not healthy, it's about your risk. Any amount of animal incrementally increases your risk for those diseases. But we all know the story of, you know, Uncle George who lived to be 96 and smoked and drank and ate cheeseburgers and hamburgers all day, every day of his life. He beat the odds. Um, it doesn't, if you do that, it doesn't guarantee you'll die young or have chronic disease, just like for smokers, it doesn't. Um, on the other hand, for every one of George who's 96, there are a hundred who are good, taking good care of themselves. Um, so it's about, it's about the odds. Um, and many diets like the Mediterranean diet do include uh, certain amounts of fish, uh, small amounts of uh, dairy products, uh, olives or olive oil. And um, many people thrive and do very well on this. It's just uh, what I try to do is tell people, here's what's best and then do what works for you within that. And there's no, wrong answer. Um, some people may say, hey, I, you know, I don't like wearing motorcycle helmets, even though I, I know it may be healthier for me. Um, but you should do what's right for you. Just recognize that you're increasing your risk of, of those kind of diseases. 
And also, if you're doing that, to keep a little closer watch on the, the precursors, your fasting blood sugar, your cholesterol level, your blood pressure. If these start to creep up, then that's where you might want to say, okay, uh, you know, I don't recommend waiting until that point because you already can get some end organ damage with prediabetes. But if they start to creep up, then you might want to rethink that strategy because I just see so many patients who wish they could rewind and, and you know, be like Alice, like, oh, I should have listened to you. Um, you know, 10 years ago, and I wouldn't have this stroke. I, again, I don't want to scare people, but it, it, it's not all or nothing. Um, do what works for you, uh, and then follow up to make sure that what you're doing is works. Commensurate it with what your goals are uh, for health and vitality. Absolutely. Okay. We have this. Thank you. I, I know I get excited about this. I don't want it to be all or nothing or scare people away. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Glenn says that he says, I guess I'm interested in a bean burger recipe to fool me and ask for suggestions. I don't know if you have any suggestions. Audience, of course, please share any bean burger suggestions in the chat for Glenn as well. Yeah. Yeah, that might be good. There are tons of great bean burger recipes. I go to forksoverknives.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Gregor's cookbook, How Not to Die cookbook, and the How Not to Diet cookbook, uh, the um, um, Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group. I think Veg Michigan has a, a resources. Um, and it, when you say to fool you, I hope what you mean is that it tastes good and you enjoy it because a bean burger isn't meant to taste just like a hamburger. That's the impossible burger. That's meant to be like it. And if you're looking for a transition food that fools you to say, wow, this tastes and looks like the real thing, then go to that first and then get to the point where, oh, this bean burger tastes just as good to me. This, this, you know, and, and there are many ways to make veggie burgers that are healthier than the impossible burgers. So, so make your transition uh, and, uh, and have fun with it, you know, and enjoy. Uh, but there, there are many great bean burger recipes. I don't have this one. Yes, definitely. Um, and it looks like uh, Anna or someone from the Troy Public Library just wrote, for anyone not looking at the chat, I'll just read this aloud real quick. They said that the Troy Public Library has many plant-based nutrition um, nutrition and cookbooks with bean burger recipes, including Forks Over Knives, uh, as Dr. Brakey recommended, My Beef with Meat by Rip Esselstein, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and much more. So definitely check out the Troy Public Library. Um, you know, give them a call or look up, look at their catalog, utilize your local library. They're going to have lots of, lots of great resources for you. Okay, Dr. Becky, we have three more questions. Are you ready okay. for them? Yeah, okay. let's rock. <laughs> All right. So Molly asks if you have any uh, tips for weight loss on a plant-based diet. Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, I recommend Dr. Greger's uh, second book in his series called How Not to Diet. Uh, mm -hmm. ET. This really is a kind of definitive evidence-based approach to what works. And in addition to high fiber, low glycemic index, that's low sugar, uh, and uh, low calorie density, that's uh, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, um, you, you want to also uh, think about some of the timing of day. Some people get better with intermittent fasting um, and limiting salt, uh, sugar, and fat, um, in particular oil. Um, oil is, is plant-based, uh, but it's 40-fold, 4,000 times the calorie density of vegetables. Uh, so people have a big salad bowl of a pound of vegetables. One tablespoon of olive oil on there just made it 60% fat. And you're thinking, boy, I'm having this great uh, low-fat salad that's great. And you just, you just turned it so that it, that fat is very easily stored by your body and you've increased the calorie density without thinking much about it. So um, focus on calorie density uh, and uh, look up how not to diet. Dr. Greger's videos have several on that as well. And most of all, fiber, fiber, fiber. Uh, fiber feeds your microbiome, which then form those short chain fatty acids, which send messages to your brain that say, hey, uh, you ate, we ate, we're done. Um, and that satiety is ultimately what it takes to lose weight. Uh, if, you're, if you're hungry and trying to just count calories and weigh food, you can't stick with that for very long enough to, to lose weight. So, but yes, absolutely. Whole food plant-based is the way for long-term sustainable weight loss with eating as much as you want, of, but of the right things. No counting calories uh, or uh, sugar grams because they're naturally occurring in whole foods in a way that come, come well-packaged. 
Absolutely. That actually leads nicely into the next question, which is from Susie. And she says, I've just discovered Vial Life cheeses. I really like them, but worry because they seem to have a lot of oils in some of them. Is this good or bad? Also, which plant-based milk do you recommend? Should coconut milk be avoided because of fats? Yeah, great question. Again, these are kind of transitional dairy foods. Uh, and uh, I don't recommend, you know, drinking glasses of plant-based milk, but if you want some on your cereal or a splash on your oatmeal uh, to put a little in your smoothies, um, use ice and water to, uh, uh, to, to dilute them. Um, but, uh, I, I don't, you know, we use many different kinds, uh, oat and almond milk, uh, soy milk. Soy milk is probably the best for kids as far as the, the protein and calorie density. Um, it also has a lot of isoflavones and helps prevent breast cancer. Um, uh, but they're, they're all so much better than, than the cow's milk <laughs> in terms of healthfulness uh, in so many ways that I try not to say, hey, you got to get this one. And if husband doesn't like that, they may not make the transition. So experiment, even within the many different types, flax, oat, soy, almond, coconut, there are many different flavors within those, you know, the manila, whatever. Uh, so uh, find one that, that works for you uh, and or mix it up some. Um, and again, not large amounts because they are processed plant foods, uh, but they're, they're a good uh, part to enjoy as part of your piece there. Uh, coconut milk um, it has some, some saturated fats, uh, but again, if you're not eating them elsewhere, the small amounts you're going to get by putting a splash on your oatmeal is not going to be significant. So I, I think you're okay there if that's your favorite one. Just don't overdo it. Okay, last question we have is from Vani. Um, they say, for kids, do you recommend vegan diets? Is there a possibility that they are going to be disadvantaged against meat eating kids in terms of sports in particular? Great question, and this is a common one. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, kids on a whole food plant-based diet do better. They grow just as, as big, as strong, as tall, again, contrary to popular belief. And this is because of the ideal balance of, of protein, of fiber, of, of phytonutrients that go into building and growing a strong young human. Um, there are some great references of resources on this now as more and more uh, plant-based uh, pediatrics are coming in. They also have a lower incidence of asthma, of eczema, of uh, autoimmune disease and allergies, of obesity, of high blood pressure. And unfortunately, we're seeing even type 2 diabetes as young as eight-year-olds now because of the standard American diet. So quite the opposite. They will be advantaged with respect to sports. And again, if you watch the documentary Game Changers, the same principles that help adult athletes to perform better also help uh, uh, kids to perform better, uh, grow healthy and strong as well. And then importantly too, later in life, we've talked about how coronary artery disease actually starts in utero. Uh, if a woman has a miscarriage and they did autopsy on the, the coronary arteries on the fetus, they see fatty streaks correlating with the mom's LDL level or cholesterol level. Um, so kids also have a, a better chance to avoid future life problems from coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, cancers, if they start out um, young as possible on uh, whole food plant-based eating. And again, differentiate that with vegan. There are a lot of uh, vegan junk food kids who have uh, you know, vegan cupcakes and Oreos, Coca-Cola, and French fries. Uh, so um, real food uh, and uh, uh, go for it at all ages. And the American Academy of Dietetics recommends a whole food plant-based diet can be well, well planned, can be healthy for people at all stages of life, pregnancy, um, uh, infancy, uh, youth, uh, adulthood, uh, elders, and uh, even people with uh, special conditions. So uh, certainly a uh, great question.